Well, welcome everybody uh, to this seminar in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. My name is Jerry Hajar. I am the department chair here. And on behalf of all my faculty colleagues, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, and also indicate that this seminar has been sponsored by our Northeastern Graduate Structural Engineering Association, uh, which is the Structural Engineering Institute uh, student chapter, graduate student chapter. Uh, several of the officers and members are here today, and thanks to them for all the organization that they helped with. Uh, we are here today for a, a special seminar, uh, and as is apparent, I wanted to mention it is being videotaped, uh, and I will explain why. Um, our guest speaker today, uh, Glenn Bell, uh, is the incoming president for the Structural Engineering Institute. Uh, starting on October 1st, 2019. Uh, and he spent the day today at Northeastern speaking to myself, uh, Professor Myers, uh, and uh, young professional, uh, Rose McClure, who, um, where we discussed uh, f uh, the future of civil engineering profession uh, and civil engineering education. And Glenn is gonna be uh, giving his thoughts on our future vision for structural engineering at this seminar. And then this is all going to be put together in a videotape uh, by the Structural Engineering Institute, uh, where Glenn will be presenting his thoughts uh, on the future in uh, consort with those that we had interviews with today. And uh, that is going to be going out live on the website to the world uh, and perhaps through other venues. And so thanks to those of you who sat in the front row. <laughs> Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce Glenn Bell. Uh, Glenn is a senior principal and former uh, chief executive officer at Simpson, Gumperts and Hager uh, here uh, in the Boston area uh, and president of the Structural Engineering Institute. Uh, pleased to have him here today for the seminar on thoughts on our future vision for structural engineering. Glenn, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. This is a subject I'm really passionate about, and I love to share stories about this and, and, and different views. And I want to particularly thank uh, the Northeastern Graduate Student Chapter of SEI for hosting us tonight, and the staff of SEI, and particularly um, Professor Hajar for making this happen. He really uh, did a lot to make, to make this evening happen, so thank you, Jerry, very much. Um, I want to start by saying that we work in the world's greatest profession. I'm convinced we work in the world's greatest profession, structural engineering. We do work that is meaningful and challenging. We do really important work for society. I mean, how many professions do you get to do that in? Um, our colleagues are just incredible people, very high caliber, very high integrity. I'm proud to work in this profession with the colleagues that we, that we work in. We are also supported and driven by tremendous professional organizations, most importantly this evening, the Structural Engineering Institute of ASCE that helps propel us forward. So it's absolutely fabulous, everything that's going on. You may or may not know that SEI is the largest of nine institutes of ASCE. We have over 30,000 members. Uh, what is really, really impressive to me, and one of the reasons I'm here in this role today, is that the degree of volunteerism and commitment, unselfish work, volunteerism by professionals and students um, is just incredible. And we're really driving this profession forward. It's really inspiring uh, to have the opportunity to help, to help lead this group. I've been pretty active in ASCE through my career. I've been practicing for 45 years now. Um, and when the institutes were created, I got active in SEI as well. But as Jerry mentioned, I was CEO of our company for some time, and there was a 22-year stint there where my day job was pretty demanding, and I didn't have the opportunity to give to SEI and the profession as much as I wanted to. So I resolved that when I gave up my CEO hat and had a little more time on my hands that I was going to get committed, and uh, that was the end of uh, 2016 that I gave that hat up. So I started inquiring about where the opportunities were, and I quickly learned that the opportunities are tremendous um, and, and, and multiple. It's just a, there's no limit to what you can do to help contribute. 
I soon found myself on the board of a newly formed division of SEI called the Global Activities Division, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, I found myself on the board of the Structural Engineering Futures Fund, which I'm also going to talk about. I found myself on the Board of Governors of SEI, which is the path that led me to this president's position now. And along the way, as we became more globalized, um, I got introduced to um, a like-minded organization headquartered in London called the Institution of Structural Engineers, known as iStructi. I don't know if any of you are familiar with iStructi, but they are a similarly sized organization, about 30,000 members. They're a bit geographically more diverse than we are, um, but we've been doing a lot of things together, um, and I found myself on their board as well. Uh, so, and this is all in the space of about five years. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a little bit of um, uh, willingness to get involved in just putting feelers out about what the opportunities are. There's no limit to what you can do and what you can contribute um, to, to SEI. So when the opportunity came to stand for the president's position, I jumped at it right away. I didn't, I didn't hesitate um, whatsoever. Um, I think a lot about the future of engineering. I always have thought a lot about the future engi of engineering. The reason being that my dad was an electrical engineer and he worked in the aerospace industry in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And he had a tremendous run. Um, I remember when I was young in the 60s that it was an exciting time. We were landing a m person on the moon. My dad was involved in some of that work. There was a lot of, it seemed like anything was possible. And from the age of three or four, as soon as I was old enough to understand what engineering was, I knew I wanted to be an engineer like my dad. Uh, but then I began to watch, because um, my dad fell on some hard times in his profession, uh, when we landed a man on the moon and funding got cut back for the space program, military spending got cut back, and um, the aerospace industry went into a deep funk. And my dad suffered from a lot of that as well. And it made me think a lot about what discipline of engineering I wanted to go into and it was time to make a choice. And I think one of the reasons that I chose civil and structural engineering is that I perceived that it would likely be a longer term, more reliable means of employment than what my dad experienced. Um, and that has certainly proven to be the case for me in the last 45 years. But one question I would like to plant out there is, uh, will the next generation of civil engineers uh, enjoy the same stability um, that, uh, that I did in the last 45 years? I don't want you to get concerned about that, but I want you to think about it uh, quite a bit. And so my dad's experience made me think a lot about what I call sustainable relevance, being sustainably relevant in industry and in the work environment and what you do. And there are many, many examples, um, particularly driven by technology in the history of humankind, where major factors, technological factors or whatever, have come up and completely disrupted an industry or a company and so forth. I think this is very well represented by the Blockbuster versus Netflix story. Uh, this graph here, if you can't read uh, the time scale, runs from 2004 to 2010. The blue line was Blockbuster, which in the mid to beginning of the late 2000s uh, was a blockbuster of a company. They were doing $6 billion in revenue, mostly just renting videotapes and DVDs. They were on a great roll. And you can see the curve. Uh, what happened? Along came the maturity of the internet, the ubiquitous of the internet, and a brazen startup called Netflix came around and said, we have a better idea. You don't have to drive to the store to rent these tapes and these DVDs. We'll stream it online for you. And in the case, in space of two years, Blockbuster went from industry leader to bankruptcy. This is the kind of story of sustainable relevance that we need to be concerned about. So if you, um, if you read me as but one, one other point here, overlaying on technological change are other driven factors, um, geopolitical factors, the distribution of wealth and, uh, and, and authority around the world. It's rapidly changing. 
Look at the great success story of Shanghai just in the space of 20 years from 1990 to 2010. So the changes around us are not only technological. We talk a lot about them, but we're getting globalized. The world is changing really fast, um, and we have to be cognizant of that. So I provide this background just to make us aware of the speed of change and what we need to do. I don't want you to take these perhaps perceptions as concern that I'm negative about the future of civil and structural engineering. In fact, I'm quite optimistic about our future. I think we are very well on the cusp of a renaissance in structural engineering. And why do I think that? Uh, if you look at the challenges, the grand challenges that society is going to be facing going forward, they really cry for structural engineering leadership. And that's where the opportunity is for us. But we have to respond. Just um, you know, a few pointers on the, on the future world. Um, we expect that by mid-century there will be about 9.5 billion people on the planet. 8 billion of those will be from developing countries. So there's a huge amount of sustainable, uh, affordable infrastructure and built environment that needs to be built here. Um, urbanization is a trend that we're all familiar with. Every day, about 200,000 people each day are moving from rural uh, environments to urban environments. Uh, so there's a tremendous opportunity for, um, for us in civil and structural engineering to make a difference. Poverty and hunger. About half the world lives on less than $2.50 a day. And the gap between the very wealthy and the very poor is widening every day. Some people think that we in the more privileged developed nations are, are responsible for this problem. And while that's um, perhaps controversial, I'm certain it's controversial, um, I think we would all agree that we have an opportunity, if not an obligation, to help with this problem. Health and pollution. The estimates are about 40% of all of the greenhouse gas emissions produced by humans are due to the work that we do the built environment, the design, construction, and operation of the built environment, 40%. That's a big issue. That's a big burden for us. And these kind of issues are not only technological, but they really require their public policy, their societal issues where we have to take leadership roles as civil and structural engineers. Scarce resources. Uh, I think we well recognize that we in the United States are consuming our share of the Earth's natural resources um, at, at an unsustainable rate. And if the developing world adopts our rate of consumption, we could quickly bankrupt our, our planet of these critical resources. So moving forward, we have to have a much more resource responsible approach to the design operation of the built environment. That's our responsibility to take charge. We have control over this. Climate change is well recognized right now the human induced components of that. Sea level is rising. The frequency of storms, the severity of storms is increasing all of the time. These are other areas where we can just not provide technical solutions, but provide leadership in setting public policy. Some of this may involve advising societies on not where to build, big questions like that. And national security. We're all concerned about national security with everything that's going on in the world right now. We may think of these as primarily political and, and military problems, but our built environment, the infrastructure, is critical to the, to the security of every nation and every society. So we have important roles to play there. So these are the reasons that I feel we have a tremendous opportunity to create a renaissance in civil and structural engineering. It's there for us to take leadership. We have an obligation uh, to do this and to play roles like we've never played before. Will we respond? So I'm really optimistic about this renaissance, but there are two caveats. There are two buts to my optimism here, and those caveats and buts are really about us. If we're going to be successful, if we're going to seize the moment and the opportunity here, we need to create a new breed of engineer than we have in the past, one that are engineering leaders, one that are more creative, innovative, collaborative, more willing to work on cross-disciplinary uh, 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 problems and really be leaders for society. 
I like to use the T-shaped analogy, analogy when I think about the structural engineer or civil engineer in the future. We tend, many of us, to be very specialized and narrow and deep in different areas. And I'm not suggesting that we lose that technical specialty that makes us what we are as, as structural and civil engineers. But we also need, at the same time, breadth. Breadth in technical and non-technical issues in the ability to work across and span and integrate various disciplines here. So number one, the first of the two buts is we need to create a new breed of engineer going forward. The second but is that we really need to work to reposition ourselves as an industry, to change people's minds about who we are and what we can do, to place ourselves in positions where we can play a more impactful role. Because if we're not proactive about that, it won't happen. We often work in the shadows. We often work in, in supporting roles. And that's not how we're going to be successful or impactful in the future. So if we can work on these two buts, I think the, our future looks uh, tremendously exciting. So we're here largely to talk about SEI. What is SEI doing about this? Um, a lot of what I'm talking about here in this vision is not only my own, it's shared with our colleagues in SEI and the whole organization, particularly the Board of Governors. What SEI is doing about this is an awful lot, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, our Board of Governors in 2008 started working on this issue in earnest. At the time, I will say there was a lot of negative talk and, 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 and uh, concern about what our future might be. That machines just may take over everything that we do and we would be re rendered irrelevant. With a lot of thought and forward-looking ideas, I think we've come a long, long way where we're all optimistic about our future right now. Uh, so our board worked um, very earnestly, great work by a lot of great people, to produce um, this first document, which is in the middle of the image here, uh, called A Vision for the Future of Structural Engineering and Structural Engineers, A Case for Change. This was published in 2013. Uh, you can find this on our website. And it set forth uh, a very inspiring and ambitious vision about our future. But it didn't just stop there with a lofty vision. It laid out a roadmap and a number of things that we needed to do to move ourselves in the right direction. Um, and there were nine of them. What I'm going to talk about is strategic objectives for this first vision. Uh, and SEI board went to work placing responsibility in the various units of SGH, different, uh, of, of, of SEI, different committees, uh, other boards and so forth and divisions to get this important work done. You know, a lot of strategic plans tend to get, I've, I've worked in business a long time, get lost in a file drawer somewhere, never to see the light of day. This has not happened with this vision. There's been a lot of hard work on this since 2013. The other thing we did rather recently, which is unusual and I'm very proud of, is our Board of Governors uh, paused, not paused, but um, looked at year five, five years into this, the question of how are we doing? Are we making progress? Are we working on the right things? Do we may need to make some mid-course corrections? And the result of that work uh, was in the document that's illustrated on the right-hand side here. We, we did a confirmation of our vision and an update to it in April of this year. So this is very recent work. And what we learned from taking an honest assessment of how we did was that we had made some great progress in some areas. We made some so-so progress in other areas, and there were a couple of areas where we had to give ourselves poor grade. It was an honest assessment of how much we progressed. We produced a lot, um, but we weren't satisfied. And we also added a couple of more strategic objectives that we realized that we need to work on to stay current. So all told right now, we have 11 strategic objectives that we're working on. And what I want to do for much of our time together this evening is talk about what those objectives are, how we're doing, um, how much progress we've made, where we're making corrections, and what it looks like going forward. Because we are now realigning everything that the SEI Board of Governors is doing behind accomplishing those 11 strategic goals. So this is fresh information, um, new information, and we're moving forward. And that will be in part my job 
uh, as the leader, as the chairman of the Board of Governors to see that we're working on the right things, working with my colleagues on the board there. One other thing that we did um, along the way to help uh, spur the initiative on was to, I will say, reinvigorate. We didn't uh, invent at that time an entity called the Structural Engineering Futures Fund, but we reinvigorated and refocused the Structural Engineering Fu Futures Fund, which you may or may not have heard of. The idea behind the Futures Fund is this. We are trying to do an enormous amount of work to redirect and focus a very large industry with um, associated industries. That's not a trivial task. It's going to take a lot of work by a lot of people. I've spoken already to the tremendous amount of volunteerism in SEI, uh, but we need more of that volunteerism. But it's not enough to have only volunteer time. We need financial resources. It costs some money to get this sort of stuff done. And so we refocused and reinvigorated in 2014 um, the SEI Futures Fund around directing resources to work on the SEI vision, and it's been very effective. My pitch to you all here today is that this is our fund, and we all need to contribute to our future. So we seek out and accept and welcome contributions from all sources, uh, whether you're more wealthy and can afford to make big contributions or small uh, and just um, able to do what you do. But we all need to get involved here. This is our commitment to moving our profession forward. And I'll touch on the Futures Fund a little bit later. So I'm going to walk through the 11 strategic objectives here, talk about what we've accomplished, where we are, where we're going with this sort of stuff. One area that I'm really excited about, we're really excited about, where we've made great progress since 2013 is in advancing performance-based design, performance-based codes and standards. What this is about is very simply that we're looking to design more of our structures now, not necessarily to highly detailed and prescriptive code requirements, but uh, performance objectives. So we're really looking at what are we really looking at in terms of the desired performance of our structures. And for certain hazards and loading scenarios, we design to levels of performance rather than satisfying code equations. This is really key, we think, to our future, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, increasingly, our codes have become very complicated, very prescriptive. Uh, I learned concrete design on the 1971 version of the ACI code, and I still have that code. It's about this thick. It's about 78 pages wide. Uh, I still use it. Um, it allowed, uh, actually, because it was not highly detailed and prescriptive, a lot of room for judgment and creativity. If you look at the current, the 2019 version of the ACI code, between the base code document and the commentary, it's over 600 pages long now, filled, filled with detailed equations that have to be satisfied. And I don't want to diminish the tremendous work and the value that's gone into that. A lot of great work um, and good thought has gone into that. But it's become so detailed and so prescriptive that it's really robbing us of our ability to, what we should be good at as humans, the thinking part of this, the creative part of this, it's boxing us in too much. It's also driven us to the point where there are so many equations to be calculated and satisfied that we can't help but surrender everything to computers now. There's no way to satisfy all of this stuff manually anymore. And that's not good either if it's done very blindly. Just tell the computer, you know, we're a commodity, go solve the code equations. That's what design is about. That's not what design should be about. And so performance-based design is our opportunity to retake our position in the design process as thinking, creative human beings, um, really top drawer professionals. So that we've also, by the way, learned through some trial designs that the prescriptive codes don't always give you the right answer. Um, there have been some interesting examples, particularly for tall and unusual buildings mm -hmm. in areas of high seismic performance that you can get a structure that is really not very desirable, uh, structural performance that's not desirable if you blindly follow the prescriptive code. So whatever you do, whether we use the code or not, we still have to think. We can't 
blindly follow the code. And we really think that performance-based design is key to moving structural engineering forward in this way. So how are we doing? Um, the leadership, I would say, in terms of implementation in performance-based design has largely been in the seismic arena, particularly for tall buildings, particularly on the west coast of the United States. And here is a document um, that was the product of an effort um, from the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center and the Charles Pankow Foundation that sets forth guidelines for performance-based design of tall buildings. That prominent structure in the middle is Salesforce Tower, uh, the tallest building in San Francisco right now that was designed to these new performance requirements. This building could not have been designed the way it, it would not have been successful even commercially if it were not for the ability to use performance-based design here. So it's a great story. And this is ubiquitous on the West Coast now. This is not future, it's not fanciful. So we're moving into other areas of performance-based design. Uh, we just published, and this was an effort of SEI, ASCE, and again, the Pankow Foundation, uh, to have a pre-standard for a performance-based wind design. This is brand new, just published um, earlier this year. Um, and although it's a pre-standard, I know of at least two engineering companies now that are using this in their guidelines to create alternative designs to prescriptive methods for codes. So this is moving forward as well. <clears throat> the third area where we've made a lot of progress is in performance-based structural fire engineering. And there is now um, an appendix in the latest version of ASCE 7, uh, 716, where you can buy an alternative method, do fire engineering, which can be quite prescriptive and quite confining by performance-based design right now. Um, so this is not to say that performance-based design is going to replace everything. Um, it's not a panacea, but it is an opportunity for us to take back control, if you will, of those things that we can do best as human engineers. There is now a SAI committee um, that is overseeing all the advancement in performance-based design. It's doing incredibly incredible work, and we're really hopeful of advancing performance-based design into all aspects of structural types and hazards. Really, really exciting progress, and most of this work has been in the last 10 years with it really coming to the fore in the last five years. Great stuff. Number two, and another area where we've been doing a lot of work is to increasingly recognize that we work in a global environment right now. We're globally interconnected. We in the United States have been a little bit insular in this way. We tend to think that sometimes everything happens within our borders. Um, and um, we recognized in SEI that there was a lot more that we could do to help engineers be effective on a global platform because we're all, whether you work on a project in your backyard or on the other side of the world, materials are sourced from around the world. We're, we're all influenced by, um, by globalization. And so um, we formed um, five years ago this Global Activities Division of SEI to help address this problem. Um, and we're, our main objective there is mostly to help U.S.-based or North American-based structural engineers practice effectively um, any place around the globe. And we're providing resources, we're providing um, things that will help with training and so forth to help us work in a global environment as well. We also recognize that we actually have a lot of SEI members outside the borders of the U.S. Uh, and there has uh, until very recently not been any SEI local chapters in places outside of North America. So one of the other objectives that we have is to start to create local chapters outside of, um, of the U.S. So those stars um, recognize the first two which were introduced this year. We have an SEI chapter as of just about a month ago in Israel and another one in Mexico City. And we're looking to expand on that as well. What are some of the other things the Global Activities of Division is doing? We are collaborating and communicating with like-minded organizations. I mentioned earlier the Institution of Structural Engineers in the UK. We have a great collaborative relationship with that organization. We're doing lots of things together. Our leadership meets twice a year to set out our collaboration agenda, and it's been a great um, thing. 
We found that um, iStruct D does some things that are honestly better than we do in SEI, and there are things that SEI does better than iStruct D. So by working together, we can eliminate waste and inefficiency and bring each the best that we have to, um, to improve structural engineering on a global basis. This is uh, pretty much brand new stuff, but one of, and I'm really excited um, that we had a great conference in Dubai just about two and a half weeks ago. This was the first ever joint SEI iStruct E international conference in structural engineering. And we brought uh, participants and panelists and speakers really literally from around the globe to talk about, to compare and contrast lessons learned from iconic global structures all around the globe. It was a great success. I'm still buzzed from coming back to that right now. And um, we're going to produce a publication on the lessons learned. This is for another lecture. I can't go into details, but it was really a very inspiring event. Um, another product of the iStruct D SEI collaboration is to bring to the US a uh, system of what's known in the UK or developed in the UK called Confidential Reporting of Structural Safety. The acronym is CROSS. And the idea behind CROSS is that we need to work together to learn from and improve our practices from the lessons that we learn from failures and problems and near misses and safety concerns. So starting in 2005 in the UK, you could go into a web portal that looks a lot like this. This is a US version right now. And you can confidentially report in um, reports of problems or failures of structural safety. And what happens is those reports are picked up and they're analyzed by an expert structural engineering panel uh, for lessons learned and suggestions on how we can improve practice and reports and newsletters and so forth are put back on the website. So the idea here is that we need to share information and learn from the problems. Um, and this is something, you know, we've done historically in construction very well. The great cathedrals were built by just observations of performance, what works and what doesn't work. But we kind of lost that discipline in the last maybe century or so, something like that. So this is our mechanism for doing it. It's been highly successful in the UK. Uh, there are reports that really show direct influence on improvements in standards of practice in the UK. So we have brought CROSS to the United States this year. Um, Andy Herman, who's sitting in the audience here, and myself are two of the drivers for this. And we went live with a US version of CROSS in July of this year. So you can actually, anyone can go on the website. Um, it's cross-us.org. You can search by keywords, or you can just go on and read all the reports you know, from beginning to end if you want to. But there's a lot to be learned from this information. And this is really working towards uh, the notion or a vision of creating a global network of cross entities where we can learn from each other uh, globally. Very exciting, another direct consequence of the collaboration we've been doing with iStruct D. One other accomplishment of the GAD, the Global Activities Division, that I want to mention here, and I could go on, but um, I have to get on to the other disciplines, the other objectives, but um, we recognize that um, for, particularly for engineers who work on shore here, who might want to, don't have familiarity with what it's like to work in different places in the world, um, there are changes, there are differences. You have to be aware of um, cultural changes, changes in business practice, legal changes, issues with licensure and contracts and so forth. It's not easy to step outside the borders and uh, you know, there's a pitfall of trying to imagine doing things by your familiar local paradigm. And so we created this global practice guide. It's not a cookbook, but it's a set of advices and, and recommendations and guidelines for what to be aware of, what to look for when you practice outside our borders here. This was published um, in the spring of this year as well. So a lot of activity from the GAD. The third initiative here is um, that we recognize that we work in an industry where there are a lot of players, a lot of organizations like SEI. We don't work in isolation. We don't want to work in isolation. And a lot of us need to work together to move this industry in the right direction. So we need to collaborate with other interested parties, other key stakeholders. Um, and we've made a lot of progress there as well. 
Uh, the top of this image here uh, shows um, an ellipse with three organizations. You see the logo of SEI. You also see the logo of the NCSEA, the National Council of Structural Engineers Association, and the logo of CASE, the Council of American Structural Engineers, which is part of ACEC. These are the three major professional organizations in the United States that deal with structural engineering. We have slightly different missions, we have very different backgrounds, um, and as our organizations have kind of grown, for a long time we didn't really cooperate or talk to each other, and that really didn't make sense. We sometimes even got into little turf wars where we were competing. Um, along the way we did something that I think was very smart in hindsight, was that we decided to publish Structure Magazine jointly. So there was something that we could pick off as a collaborative thing, and it worked very well. And that's led to a deeper collaboration with these organizations, where now, uh, just as we do with iStruct-D, the leadership of SEI meets twice a year with the leadership of NCSEA and the leadership of CASE. Um, and one of the really exciting developments about this is that we got together just in the last year, year and a half, and agreed on and published a joint vision for the future of structural engineering. So here are the pre three primary infra um, organizations publishing a joint vision, and we've taken our strategic objectives and uh, blended them with some of the other two organizations, and we have a set of objectives that we want, things that we want to work on together, that we are working on together to move the profession forward. So this is great because we're bringing in even more resources, um, in more influence, um, and I think it's a, it's a tremendous accomplishment. This again was, con was uh, consummated just this year. I hope you get a sense of the degree of activity that's going on right now. Um, Another area that uh, is an important strategic objective is to promote the structural engineer as a leader and innovator. This was one of the areas where we weren't as satisfied as with our progress as we wanted to be. Um, and I think after talking about why, uh, we came to the realization that maybe we were looking at this problem a little bit too narrowly. We started, started with the premise that in the structural engineering community, we aren't necessarily recognized for the good work that we do. We're not in the spotlight. Sometimes we play supporting, subservient roles. And we sort of had the impression that if we could just sort of promote ourselves, you know, make the public in the industry aware of all the good things that we do, then magically things would happen. And we certainly need to make the world aware of the things that we do. But this objective is a really a lot more complex than that. And so we've sort of altered our strategy here by looking at three things. It's not only promoting ourselves, we have to prepare ourselves. If we're going to step into these larger leadership roles where we are um, doing more creative work, more collaborative work, more innovation and so forth, uh, we have to prepare ourselves as professionals to play that role. It's not enough to say we want to do this and ex expect to step into those positions. Um, and that has a lot to do with what we're talking about in reform of engineering education, um, not only at university level, but beyond. Uh, we just can't say we're gonna do it. We have to prepare ourselves, and that's gonna take some time. We also have to position ourselves as an industry. I talked about this a little bit earlier. This is proactive. We have to seek out where the opportunities are for us to play leadership roles and position ourselves in society. So we've completely redirected this particular objective and it's so important to us on the SEI Board of Governors that we kicked it up to an SEI group called the SEI Leadership Council. What the SEI Leadership Council is is a cadre of all of the past presidents of SEI. So these, this is a really high-powered group, very experienced group, and we said to them, we'd like you to take this on. This is important. Um, so we have some tremendous experience and brain power working on this problem. And this is only in the last month or two that we've moved in this direction. Uh, number five is to reform structural engineering education, to bring about the development. And this particular one is focused on university level. It's a tough problem. Uh, we have people in industry and people in academia on committees and different work uh, working together on this. But um, 
you know, just changing industry is daunting enough, but when you couple that with how academia works uh, and, and appreciate, each one has to understand where the other's coming from here. It has to be a true collaborative relationship. So we formed, um, on the original publication of the vision document, a committee called Committee on Reform of Structural Engineering Education. The acronym is CROSS-E, not to be confused with CROSS. And this group has been working on grappling some really big problems. It's not easy work. Um, it's not a committee that I would join lightly, but it's important work that, <coughs> that needs to be done. If I had the time, I definitely would jump in. Uh, but they have tough work to do. Um, they're due, that committee is due to present their report, their findings to the Board of Governors by next spring. But I've heard, you know, some of the things that they're coming up with, uh, some of their preliminary conclusions are that we need more flexibility in our engineering programs. We're perhaps overly constrained in our engineering programs. And if you look at the diversity of skills and backgrounds that we need structural engineers to come from and to do in the future, we need more flexibility. Um, infusing creativity into the engineering curriculum, really very, very important. That's talked about in just about every venue on this. Um, they're concluding that we could use for better training for professors um, in pedagogy and teaching practices as well. Um, I know a lot of professors who are great teachers, but the question that's asked is, does a PhD in structural engineering necessarily make you a good teacher? Uh, it's a, you know, it, you have to go through a lot more to teach in a public school system in terms of proving your teaching credentials. Um, and so that's something that's come to the fore. And then in the interest of sort of understanding, bringing the practical, the practice side into a university environment, they're exploring very deeply the role of adjunct professors in this as well. So that committee is doing some very good work. They have a tough job. Another uh, parallel effort that's going on, and this is on the ASCE plane, not the SEI plane, there is a group um, called the ASCE Department Heads Coordinating Council. It's the Civil Engineering um, Coordinating Council. All the department heads get together. We are privileged to have the leader of that group, Professor Hejar here, working on this. Um, and I know the work that he's putting into it, the great work in trying to really get all of the Civil Engineering Department heads on the same page to move us forward. And it's uh, great, great work, Jerry. Last year, Jerry organized with his group um, a civil engineering education summit. It was great work done there in May of 2019. So we're pushing forward on this agenda as well. A couple of other areas that were somewhat related um, are enhancing the professional development of practicing engineers. This is largely what happens focused after the university environment. And if you think about the amount of change that we're expecting um, in, in the world and in our work in the future, and think about the amount of time that one spends in the profession after university, it could be 40, 50 years where we know we're gonna have to constantly learn and adapt and so forth. So this becomes really important. How do we continue to prepare ourselves and stay nimble and address change? Uh, we have a committee on continuing education that's working hard on this. Uh, and similarly, uh, to improve the mentoring of young engineers. And that really is about the role of on-the-job activities um, in a working environment as a learning experience. Um, the work that we've done to date on that is really interesting. Most of it, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, is about reaching out um, mostly to young professionals about their views on what good mentoring is and isn't. Um, and because that's, you know, we have to go to the source, what works and what doesn't. Uh, to be honest, we're kind of experimenting with this. And uh, some of the formal programs that have been tried haven't necessarily gotten the best um, grades. So we're trying to find out what the right answer is for this. On some level, it seems like the most informal but very personal and committed relationships are the key answer. And just laying structure on top of that and expecting that that's going to work hasn't been working particularly well. So this is, this is a tough one too. Recognizing, as I mentioned earlier, that we need to work in a much more multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary fashion, we resolve to hold regular multidisciplinary workshops of technical matters to broad interest of structural engineers. So we held our first interdisciplinary uh, 
conference at Structures Congress last year in 2018. That was focused on the resilience of structures and infrastructure system systems. It was highly successful. And next year at Structures Congress 2020, we plan to hold the second summit. And that will be um, focused on AI, data science, and its role in structural engineering. I think you can appreciate that both of these are really relevant and important and multidisciplinary topics. So if we're going to be successful in pursuing these types of objectives, we have to cut across disciplines. And that's what what's this is about. Advocating for structural engineering licensure. Um, there is a strong contingent in our industry that has the feeling that we really need to raise the bar on our educational and training requirements, our qualifications for um, licensure in structural engineering. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the fact that, um, well, first of all, licensure is up to each of the individual states as to how it works. That's a real headache for us here, but that's what, uh, you know, that, 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 that's what, that's just the way it is. Um, and most states are professional engineer or civil engineering uh, states in some measure. There are about 10 states right now largely on the West Coast, but not exclusively on the West Coast, where they have a specialty structural engineering licensure that is um, a significant uh, qualification above in terms of the exam and the qualifications. And um, SEI is really interested, and other organizations are, in trying to proliferate the structural engineering standard across the United States. It's been tough. We have to convince another 40 states and some territories of the U.S. to go in this direction, and it's a slow slog. But here we have created a collaborative organization of interested people, interested organization called the Structural Engineering Licensure Coalition. It is comprised of SEI, and I've mentioned NCSEA in case, but also another entity called the Structural Engineering Certification Board. So we're unified. We're bringing this power to lobby and bear and try to proliferate um, structural engineering licensure across the country. So um, those nine that I just mentioned were the original nine of the vision. And the last two that I'm going to present here are new ones that we added just this year. Um, the first one, and you sort of look at this and say, duh, it should have been there from the beginning, but we missed it. Um, but it's to encourage resiliency and sustainability in all of our structures. One of the reasons um, that I think this is there this time is I have noticed, and maybe you have, that even in the last year or two, uh, these issues have risen to the very top of our agenda. They're coming on like storms right now. And um, they're urgent, you know, particularly the sustainability initiative. It's an urgent issue. These are related issues because, you know, part of our carbon problem is changing our hazards, and then we have to react to that by having more resilient structures. So they're sort of related in that way. But we need to work on this problem from both ends of the spectrum, if you will. So here are some of the things that are going, that are going on right now already. Uh, one of the very big ones is called SE 2050, or the Structural Engineers 2050 Challenge. This is a challenge laid down by the Carbon Leadership Forum. And their objective is to say that by the year 2050, we should be designing structures that have zero net embodied carbon, 2050. That's a pretty bold goal. And when I first heard about this, I thought, this is pretty fanciful. What are, what are we going to do? Reject concrete and steel and only build wood buildings? You know, how do we do that? Um, as we've dug into it, there are actually are a lot of strategies and it's not as fanciful and crazy as, as you might think. But you need to study this and why. So our SEI 2050s, uh, excuse me, our SEI Sustainability Committee is working with the SE 2050 Challenge uh, to persuade structural engineering companies and SEI to embrace this challenge and to move it forward. And they're doing a great job and having good progress. Um, I would encourage you to go on their website the SE2050, it's a, it's a real initiative and you're going to hear more about it. On the resilience side, there's a lot going on. Uh, one of my favorite projects, um, I'm actually involved on an advisory committee of this, is a Center for Risk-Based Community Resilience uh, Planning. This is a long-term research project funded by NIST 
and it is uh, headquartered at Colorado State University um, in Boulder. And um, it's, uh, uh, there are 90, over 90 researchers involved with this. A five-year program that is about, we hope to be renewed for another five years. And what this is seeking to do is create models and a computing platform. I don't want you to think of software. It's a computing platform where right now it's for researchers, but we're looking to take this into um, you know, the practice environment where we can model um, the impact of hazards, um, not only from a physical infrastructure perspective, but from the sociological and um, economic perspective. And these things are intertwined. So these 90 researchers I mentioned are not only engineers, they include sociologists and economists that are developing very complex models. And this tool uh, we hope will be useful to communities, to cities, um, maybe other entities like university campuses who might want to uh, take a long-term view of their resilience. And what this tool will allow a community to do is determine what the optimal and type injection of resources would be to improve the resilience of their facility. It's a really exciting thing, really multidisciplinary. I think the future of civil engineering on steroids. I hold this up as an example of great work that we need to head into. And we do have within ASCE, this is not an SEI committee uh, because resilience cuts it really across all the institutes, um, a, a resilience um, committee within ASCE. The second um, uh, objective is to promote diversity by supporting AC Policy Statement 417. If you're not familiar with AC Policy se uh, Statement 417, here it is, and I won't read all the language, but in essence it is encouraging, driving towards equitable opportunity for all people in civil engineering. It's a great goal. Um, one, I think, really cool project that's been going on for several years now through SEA, NCSEA, this really started out of uh, SEOC, uh, but uh, grew to NCSEA, and it's become a national, even somewhat of an international presence right now, is a study, and Rose McClure, put your hand up please, Rose, is one of the primary drivers of that. Um, and SE3 stands for Structural Engineering Engagement and Equity, and one of the great pieces of work that this group has done is actually to go through through surveys and numerous conversations what the views are particularly uh, amongst young engineers about engagement and equity. So they're getting facts in where you need facts in an area that can be pretty controversial and very sensitive as well. They've done a tremendous job. Um, their website is shown there, the URL is right there. I'd encourage you to go on. There's lots of reports and great resources and even a video on the work that they've done. So those are the 11 um, SEI objectives and I'm sort of moving towards conclusion here. But before I um, start to wind up, I have to mention an exciting initiative that's going on on the ASCE plane now where ASCE has t undertaken a very ambitious project to try to help design and understand the future world in which we are working. Um, and the industry leaders uh, uh, council of ASCE has been driving this forward. Um, and one person on the ASCE staff, his name is Jerry Buckwalter. I think you're gonna be hearing more from him. Um, Jerry actually came out of the aerospace industry where he was responsible at Northrop Grumman for the strategic direction of that firm. And he was influencing you know, where that huge industry was going. Did it highly successfully, and now he's with us in civil engineering. He wants to help us in civil engineering envision our world and make sure that we're very well prepared. The idea behind Future World Vision is that we really try to understand the world in which we're gonna be working uh, in about 50 years from now. Now we all know that nobody has a crystal ball, and we can't do this with guesswork at the same time either. But the way that ASCE has approached this is um, they have actually put hard science behind it. They hired a strategic planning firm from the Boston area 
and they're trying to imagine what various scenarios, possible scenarios might be for our future. And there are multiple outcomes from the study that they did. But the notion is we're not trying to predict exactly what it's going to look like in 50 years, but as Jerry says, paint the corners of what is likely or possible. And um, they did a very interesting study where they looked at different trends, things that are going on in the world around us, changes in demographics, climate change, things with energy and so forth. And they looked at all of these trends and projected out and looked at the variability of those trends and said if we combine these trends in different ways, what scenarios emerge? It was really, so this is hard science. This is not guesswork. Um, and out of that came really something really exciting. Uh, the five scenarios they had identified are the megacity. If you want to envision a megacity, imagine that everything from Boston to Washington, D.C. is connected in one city. Um, the rural city, which is really an interconnection of rural communities across a wider geographic spectrum. The floating city, where we're building a lot of habitable space offshore. Um, the frozen city and the off-planet city. I don't know whether that's Mars or whatever. Uh, but these are, these are really interesting. And what they're doing right now, this is a really ambitious program, is creating scenarios through a 4D immersive storytelling experience where they're creating these, these scenarios, these cities in virtual space. Um, and there was a demonstration of this at the ASE convention just the week before last. Andy Herman was there. You see somebody with um, immersive uh, goggles there. This is really how it works. You put your goggles on and you can walk around the city and you can imagine and see how, th how things are, are working. Um, and this is not a video game. Jerry is very quick to point out this is not a video game. This is based on hard science. And what are its purposes? You know, we want to inspire the next generation of civil engineers to imagine what the world is going to look like and how we can contribute but also peak public interest in what we're doing. Uh, we want to work on cross-disciplinary leadership. That's a big theme moving forward. Interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary stuff, systems thinking are all things that Jerry talks about. And to foster new innovations. So you go through one of these um, future cities, see what's happening, things that look like, and say, what will we have to do in terms of innovation in order to achieve that? So it's really exciting. I have a short video clip here um, that um, I will just show you before we wind up that Jerry lent to To me. look out 50 years is not normal, but we felt we had to take a step out that far. This is an industry that has built nations over thousands of years. of today will be a kind of DJ constantly tuning to mm. make the optimum atmosphere for the people in that city. This is going to be a very exciting ride. So at this stage, uh, the floating city has been created and they're working on the other four. Um, so stay tuned. You can see some of this information on ASC's website. I think it's tremendously exciting. ASC has really doubled down on our, on our future here, and I think that we're all going to benefit from this. So I want to uh, sort of bring us back from 50 years now and present and just focus a little bit about what I and the board are going to be focusing on in the coming year before I wind up. Um, these are two things here that I'm personally passionate about and want to emphasize in my work with the board this year. I'm really passionate about developing and enabling the next generation of structural engineering leaders. Um, what do we do? And, and what is the strategy for doing that? There are a lot of ideas and I don't have time to go into all of them now, but I really think that one of the key strategies is that we need to recognize that in the future more than ever, a career in structural engineering or civil engineering for that matter is going to require a commitment to lifelong learning. 
it's going to be even more critical in the future than it is now. We're constantly, no matter what your age or how far you are in to the profession, going to have to be learning and adapting all of the time. And that has profound implications. It has implications for a university environment. It keeps Jerry up late at night, as it should, and you should be happy that he lays awake thinking about this at night, uh, because it means what is the role of a university setting in, in a new world, in a rapidly changing world. Um, and I think that one of the things that we need to do with this, and Jerry and I have talked a lot about this, is really have a deep and continuous dialogue between industry and academia about what our expectations are from the various phases of an engineer's development from a university setting, undergraduate, graduate school, that period uh, before licensure of internship, and the very long period of ongoing professional development after that. I believe, and I think a lot of people agree, that if we're going to prepare engineers for a rapidly changing world, we really have to focus the undergraduate exper experience strongly on fundamentals. That's going to be our anchor for a rapidly changing world. Um, and I know a lot of others who hold that. Um, the other thing I have come to realize, you know, we talk about the qualities that we want in structural engineers in the future. And at first blush, it sounds like we're trying to create engineering superhumans right now, where we want everybody to have all of the qualities that structural engineering demands from us. And I think the answer there is that that's really not realistic. We've come to realize that really isn't realistic. And the consequence of that is to recognize that to be successful in the future, we need structural engineers of varying backgrounds and roles and capabilities. Um, so for example, we still need people of very narrow technical expertise in some areas, but we also need generalists. We need creative designers. We need people who can be leaders on a societal level and, uh, and a project level. We need people who are very good at innovation and entrepreneurship. No one of us is going to be sufficiently good at all of those things. And what's the consequence? Structural engineering is a team sport. Okay? We're not going to come out of cookie cutters. And that means that we really need to broaden and bring more flexibility to our engineering curricula. We may come from very different backgrounds um, and very different experiences as we meld together as structural engineers in the future. How do we enable the next generation of structural engineers? This is something we're really focused on in SEI, and I was talking to others earlier about this today in some meetings. We in SEI are doing everything we can to push students and young professionals into leadership positions. And something that we created through the Futures Fund that's been very successful is to create um, scholarships to send, send students and young professionals to Structures Congress, individuals who couldn't otherwise uh, afford to go to Structures Congress. And it's been extremely successful for, for the past several years that we've had it. Some of the people, young professionals, who entered that program are now emerging leaders in SEI today. And we've been increasing each year the amount of funding that we devote to this. Another similar initiative um, is that we recognize that a lot of our committees, particularly high-level technical committees, tend to be populated by older people with a lot of gray hair. And uh, that's really not a good thing. Um, a lot of young professionals don't go into this because they might feel intimidated. You know, it's really not bad. We're not that intimidating. We gray hairs. Um, but we created scholarships now and specific goals to move young professionals onto committees. So we're trying to, on almost all of our committees, to have young professional representatives. The feedback from the committee chairs on that initiative has been fantastic. The feedback from the young professionals who participate have been you know what, this isn't so scary and we have a role to play here. We want to do more of this. So it's been, it's been fantastic. So we're pushing students and young professionals um, into the limelight here. The last point that I want to make and I think is a key strategy is to integrate better practice education and research. We need more professors in the class, uh, more uh, um, practitioners in the classroom. We need more influence of academics in creative work in industry as well. And we have to be working on more collaborative research uh, because we badly need 
innovation uh, brought to practice much more quickly than we are now if we're going to keep up with the pace of change in the future. So the goal here is to work sort of this continuous virtuous cycle where needs driven research and more immediately is disseminated into industry, is adopted in, in, in industry, and that in-field experience with that innovation is circled back into new research, so we have this continuous virtuous cycle. One of the models, I think, for real good needs-driven industry research is the Charles Pankow Foundation, which I've mentioned a couple of times here. Uh, one of the, two of the hallmarks, I think, of the MO of the Pankow Foundation are Number one, they will only fund research that, that is identified from a real industry need, a validated industry need, validated by industry professionals who know. These are the most important things we need to focus on to drive our industry forward, and that's done very carefully. And the other thing is that every product from the Pankow's research work, the stuff that they fund, must be immediately implementable into practice. This is not theoretical stuff that leads to another research project. I'm not den denigrating that. I'm a big fan of pure research as well. But we need a lot more on the practical side also, and we need a balance here. So I really hope to see a proliferation of the Pankow model. So just in closing thoughts, I hope you appreciate the tremendous amount of work that's going on in SEI right now. A lot of the examples that I've shown to you are active now have come to fruition just in the last year or two. I've never seen so much activity in SEI in my career with SEI. It's really a very exciting time. So my pitch to you is we need more volunteer help. We need you to get involved. Please join committees. Come to Structures Congress. Go out and write papers. Get active in your local group here. Mentor um, other engineers. This is really important. And please contribute to the SEI Futures Fund. We need this to propel ourselves forward. So with that, um, I want to thank again Northeastern, your graduate student chapter here, Jerry, fantastic job in making tonight possible. The SEI staff, Suzanne is represented here. Um, a lot of good work went into making tonight possible. So thank you very much. And if we have time, we'll take a few questions. Yeah. Do we have questions? If you have questions, uh, we've been asked, we ask you to go up to the mic there. <laughs> So yeah, thank you very much for those great, uh, a lot of like interesting stuff, interesting ideas, and like pretty encouraging. Uh, one thing I was wondering about, like uh, you had some sort of like a statement from like the three structural engineering groups, and talking about like that you know structural yeah. engineers right need to artic articulate a vision that's like what was it understood, embraced, and admired by the mm -hmm. public. Yep. And so then I was I was kind of thinking about like what about you know. How do you see the profession going forward, making sure that we're like also informed by the public? You know, so if we're going to be leaders, sure we can lead, but you know, should the public not be informed of where it is that we're leading? You know, and it seems to me like one of the most appealing parts about being a civil engineer, a civil engineer, is that we're civil servants. Right. You right. know, so how do you see that? Uh, you know, how do we engage with the public and, and listen to them? That's a really great question, thanks. Um, it really comes down to the collaboration and the communication piece, and we have to reach out to organizations that represent the public and communicate with the public, and that goes beyond the engineering organizations, so that's a part of our objective as well. So we do need to be, we need to communicate out to the public for some of the reasons, but we also have to get feedback back again. Um, and I'll point to the, um, in this example, uh, the community resilience planning project I worked on, where, or where I, I talked about rather, um, where we're bringing economists and sociologists into the picture and they're all reaching out as well. And we need a lot more of this multidisciplinary research. Um, I've been involved with that project for five years now and it really has been an incredible experience to uh, watch engineers and economists and sociologists try to work together. Um, and we were two years into the program, I think, before we even had a common language where we knew how to speak to each other. Because resilience, the simple word resilience, meant very different things to all three. Um, the interesting part of it to me, and sort of as an observer, and this is really an aside, is I think the engineers had more in common with the economists 
than the economists had with the sociologists because it, they're, they're both quantitative, right? There's a lot of rational thinking in all of that. Uh, and it's really been fun to work with the sociologists who are out there um, looking at the social impact of a disaster. Um, some of it is just heartbreaking, you know, what goes on, but what happens to a community when there's a disaster. And the real um, awakening for me in this project was um, I would always think about resilience um, or a resilient type of community in terms of the physical infrastructure. And what I came to realize, and this has impacted my view of our role here, is that the health of a community is really about the people. It's not about the infrastructure. The infrastructure serves the society. Um, and I, it's caused me to think about the problem and our role in a completely different way. Um, so we need to do more of that type of stuff. It's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Really enjoyed it. Great.